Hello students and welcome to lecture six of our biology course, Biology 100 course. Today, as I promised, we're going to spend the rest of the semester dealing with one particular organ system every week. And this week we're going to learn about the musculoskeletal system. Now obviously sometimes the skeletal system and the muscular system are considered to be separate uh, organ systems, but it's easier to com combine them uh, sometimes because the skeletal muscles are involved with moving the skeleton, the skeletal bones around. Uh, so we'll, dis we'll, we'll discuss the musculoskeletal uh, system and then we'll learn the names of the important bones in the human skeleton and the important muscles that move those bones. Just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to mention the, start by mentioning the fact that the word osteo, the, the prefix osteo, refers to bones. And so you've probably heard of the, a disease called osteoporosis. Uh, that, of course, is a disease, a problem where the bones become very brittle, especially in women as they age, as they, as they become elderly. The word osteon is, is a... Is a um, uh, sorry, the word oste an osteon is one of the fun fundamental building units for bones. You know, like we talked about monomers being put together, the, the monomeric units that are used to put together proteins or, or polysaccharides. Well, the, the individual monomers that are put together to make up a type of bone called compact bone is referred to as an osteon. There are certain cells that are present in bone that that are responsible for either making bone or taking bone apart. They are called osteocytes. Specifically, the, the bone cells that are responsible for building bone are called osteoblasts, right? So the word osteo refers to the bone. Uh, if I forget to mention it later on, I should also tell you that you do need to know what these suffixes for the different organ systems mean. So the word osteo refers to bone. The word hepato refers to the liver. The word renal refers to the kidneys, the, the kidney system, right? And the word, so the word osteo means bone today. Okay, so the uh, today subject of the first lecture is about the bone system, the skeletal system. So the word osteo applies to a lot of words that have to do with the bones. Okay, now we've already discussed, when we discussed the histology section, we discussed what cartilage is and how cartilage is built by a type of cell called a chondrocyte, a chondrocyte. And osseous tissue, which is a fancy term for bone, osseous tissue is originally starts out as being cartilage. So cartilage is created and then converted to bone by adding minerals to it, mineral salts to it, particularly calcium salts, such as calcium hydroxide, calcium phosphate. Uh, so if you take cartilage and then you add a lot of calcium to it and you reorganize it a little bit here and there, you have successfully converted cartilage into bone. And interestingly, on the evolutionary scale, the people who, the experts in evolution, believe that uh, um, cartilage, the, the evolution of cartilage in animals preceded or came before bone. So uh, 500 million years ago or so, we had uh, fish in the ocean that had cartilage skeletons, skeletons that are made entirely of cartilage and not bone. And those fish, some of them are still around today. Those are the sharks. Things like sharks, dogfish, and uh, stingrays all have skeletons that are made of cartilage and not bone. Uh, and then later on, a few hundred million years later, fish developed a skeleton that was made of bone instead of cartilage and this was this this type of skeleton was created by adding calcium phosphate and calcium hydroxide to the cartilage and those those fish are called osteichthians and and they so they are actually they contain the word osteo as well so we started out with cartilage fish then we then the bony fish evolved from the cartilage fish just because one animal evolves from another animal doesn't mean that the first type of animal disappears uh, it's possible to have the older animals the more primitive animals existing at the same time with the more modern ones that that's a fact so um, uh, so so cartilage predated bone 
And in fact, in the human body, cartilage predates bone as well because bone is made from cartilage. And so if you talk about uh, a developing fetus, a baby that's developing in its mother's womb, we call a baby that's developing in the mother's womb a fetus. And uh, the fetal skeleton is originally, during development, the fetal skeleton is made out of cartilage, which is eventually converted to bone before the baby is born. All right, then I'll, I'll briefly discuss, um, in this course, I sometimes like to compare humans to other animals, just to give you a frame of reference about how humans may differ from other types of animals. And so in this case, I wanted to draw to your attention, I'll, I'll briefly talk about the difference between an exoskeleton and an endoskeleton. The word exoskeleton means that you have the skeleton on the outside of the body. And so lots of animals like crustaceans, you know, crabs and lobsters have that. Insects do as well. Uh, if you have an exoskeleton, you're much tougher than an animal that has an endoskeleton because the endoskeleton, the skeleton in general is meant to provide support for the body as well as protection. So it, it's the, all of the organs are held into their positions in the body by the skeleton. And uh, the skeleton is also meant to prevent uh, protection from, uh, meant to provide protection from damage. So uh, if, you, if something hits the human body, we get a bruise, we can get damaged quite badly if something hits us, whereas, uh, because we have an endoskeleton, whereas things like insects and crabs and lobsters, you can hit them with something and they don't sustain any damage because they have a shell or an exoskeleton on the outside. Uh, as you know, if you've ever eaten a crab or a lobster, once you break the, ex the exoskeleton off, you have the tissue inside that is just uh, helpless. There's no, you know, you don't take the shell off of a crab and then find a skeleton on the inside of the crab. That doesn't happen because it has an exoskeleton. Whereas there are some animals that are more vulnerable to damage like humans and fish and other things like that that have an endoskeleton. All right, now there are two broad categories of bone tissue. There are two general types of bone. They are called compact bone and spongy bone. And I will mention the fact that compact bone is made out of units called osteons. And spongy bone is made of, of different units that are not quite as strong that are called trabecula. Okay, and then we'll talk about the three different types of bone cells. An osteocyte is the general term for a bone cell. The word site means cell, right? And then osteo means specifically that it's a bone cell. And that's just the general term for either uh, uh, an osteocyte that just sits there versus an osteoblast and an osteoclast. An osteoblast is an osteocyte whose job it is to build bone. And an osteoclast is a uh, an osteocyte whose job it is to take bones apart. Okay, why on earth would you want to take bones apart? Because you would your body sometimes wants to it needs to get to the calcium that's being stored inside those bones. Right? It needs to get to the calcium that's being stored inside those bones. So I mentioned earlier on during the, the talk on homeostasis that we normally are expected to have a certain concentration of calcium in our blood many of the cells in the human body use calcium to catalyze chemical reactions and so every cell needs to have access to calcium the calcium is delivered to the cells by the blood what happens if the if the concentration of calcium in the blood drops too low then home uh, the amount of calcium in the blood the concentration of calcium in the blood is controlled through homeostasis that means that if the concentration of calcium in your blood gets too high the osteopla osteoblasts get busy and they build more bone tissue. And then the, the calcium is sequestered or put into the bones. And therefore, the, the concentration of calcium in the blood will drop back to the normal level. On the other hand, if the concentration of calcium in the blood becomes too low, the osteoclasts will get busy and they will take the bone apart in order to release calcium from the bone into the bloodstream so the calcium can go back up to its set point according to homeostasis. So we have homeostatic control over the amount of calcium that's in the blood. And this is done by either building bone or taking bone apart to either sequester or to release calcium from the bone into the blood. Right? So sequester, if there's too much calcium in the blood, 
you build more bone and then put that calcium in with the bone, with the new bone, that is called sequestering. Sequestering means to take something and put it away someplace. That's what the word sequester means. Okay, so if you want to sequest, if, if you, if the concentration of calcium in the blood is too high, you lower it by sequestering some of the calcium into the bone. All right, now when we're growing, our bones are expanding. That's how we grow taller, for instance. We, we, we start out being short, short little children, and then we grow to be tall adults. This is accomplished because we build new bone. So that means when we're, when we're growing, the osteoblasts are working harder than the osteoclasts to create new bone tissue. Then at some point we stop growing, right? And the, the osteoblasts start taking a break and saying, well, that was a lot of work. Let's rest for a while. And so the, what happens is the osteoblasts stop working as hard as they were working when you were growing, and the osteoclasts will start taking the bone apart slowly. And so, but at some point, just after you stop growing, or shortly after you stop growing vertically, shortly after you stop growing, you, ha you will hit what is known as peak bone mass. Peak bone mass is where, uh, is where your bones are the strongest that they will ever be because you have the most bone tissue that you will ever have. And generally, every year after you hit peak bone mass, every year after you hit peak bone mass, you will lose about 1% of your bone mass from then on. Uh, you can see that if you, if you live long enough, your bones will become very brittle because if you were losing about approximately 1% or 2% per year after that, after you stop growing, eventually you'll get to a point where you've lost more than half of the bone mass, more than half of the bone strength that you once had. Once you reach, a, once you reach half of your peak bone mass, that's called osteoporosis. Um, okay, so the building of bone and the taking apart of bone are two different sides of the same coin, and that coin is called bone remodeling. Right, so bone remodeling refers to the building of bone by osteoblasts and the taking apart of bone by osteoclasts. And this process happens in such a way that you reach peak bone mass at a certain point in your life. Generally, you reach peak bone mass about five years after you stop growing vertically. So that means in my case, I was as tall when I was 16 years old as I am now. So I stopped growing vertically when I was 16. That means I hit my peak bone mass. I had peak bone mass when I was about 21 years old. And then from the, age, from the ages after 21, I was losing about one or two percent of bone mass per year, and so I've lost at this point. I've lost about forty percent of the bone mass. I, I have only about sixty percent of the bone mass that I had when I was when I was at peak bone mass. So my bones are much more brittle now than they were when I was twenty-one or even when I was thirty-one, for instance. So this happens to everybody, and this is why one of the most frequent injuries and one of the most frequent problems that elderly people have is broken bones. So you have to avoid uh, putting elderly people into situations where they may fall or slip and, and, and or be hit by something and break a bone or fracture a bone because their bones are very easy to break and once they're broken they take a long time to repair because the osteoblasts are no longer very active. The osteoblasts are not very active anymore. All right, so let's talk about that. And then after we've discussed all of that, we will discuss the human skeleton and we will learn the names of the, the important bones in the human skeleton. You must remember them all because they will be on quizzes and tests. And then we'll talk about how to fracture, how, how, when bones are broken, we call that fractures. And bones can break in different ways. They can fracture in different ways. And so there are different names for different types of broken bones. And we'll, those are, so we will learn how to classify different bone fractures and you will be responsible for that on the, on the exams as well. And then we'll talk about the important muscles that move the important bones. Okay. All right, let's talk about the evolution of the skeleton in general. Uh, humans are the most advanced animals uh, and we have an endoskeleton uh, but it wasn't always so. On the evolutionary scale animals did not originally have skeletons so let's learn about that. 
Okay, the earliest animals, believe it or not, were the sea sponges, the sponges that you find in the ocean. And so those were the, those were the first animals to develop, to evolve in, in the world. Right? And they did not have a skeleton. In addition to that, they did not have symmetry, right? So if you look at a if you look at a sea sponge, different types of sea sponges, they do not have radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry. Their their shape is kind of they have a kind of a haphazard random shape, and so the earliest animals did not have symmetry, and then the the the, the sea sponges uh, 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 evolved into a a, 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 um, a phylum called the uh, called called the cnidaria which have radial symmetry and then some of the cnidaria evolved into other types of animals like including humans which are members of a phylum called uh, oh I've forgotten what the human phylum is called now um, the chordata I'm sorry I apologize the chordata is the phylum that the humans belong to and members of the chordata generally have a proper bilateral symmetry and a proper skeleton all right so the earliest animals the sea sponges had no skeletons and then some of those animals evolved into more advanced animals that had uh, like sea stars, for instance, which are commonly called starfish. Some of those animals evolved into animals that had radial symmetry like starfish that had something called a hydrostatic skeleton. Now a hydrostatic skeleton, these animals lived in the ocean. We're still talking about animals living in the ocean. And they had little pockets that they could fill up with fluid and create pressure, fluid pressure inside these pockets, which had the effect of holding them into their proper shape. And then eventually, some of those animals evolved into the cartilage fish, which are known as the chondrichthians. Chondrichthians are fish that have a skeleton that's made out of uh, cartilage. Okay, so the earliest animals in the ocean were the, the, you know, so we're not talking about plants. There were nothing but plants in the ocean for a long time, but eventually some of the plants lost the ability to photosynthesize. So they, they, they're, they're not, you can easily spot them because they're not green. Uh, so green plants contain chlorophyll, which allows them to carry out photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a way of building tissue using energy from sunlight. As soon as you stop having that ability, you're an animal, right? So, so the the sea sponges were the first animals. They were no longer no longer photosynthetic, and they had to rely on eating other life forms in order to survive. So, sea sponges typically eat seaweed, uh, not seaweed, but uh, algae and bacteria and protists. They they kind of absorb them and then dissolve them and eat them. So that's a sea st uh, a sea sponge on the left. On the right, we have a sea star. The sea stars were among the first fish. Uh, sea stars are commonly called starfish, but as a proper biologist, you would know that you can't call this a fish because it doesn't have it doesn't have fins or a tail. In order to be a fish, you have to have fins and a tail. Right? So a jellyfish is not a fish. Uh, the technical term for a jellyfish is we simply call it a jelly. Uh, again, a starfish is not a fish. Technically, its its proper name is called a sea star. Okay, so the sea stars had hydrostatic pockets. They had a hydrostatic skeleton where they had fluid pockets inside the arms. And notice that a, that a, uh, a sea star has radial symmetry. It's sort of the same if you rotate it around 360 degrees. If you turn it in a complete circle, it looks sort of the same on all sides. It doesn't, it's not asymmetrical the way uh, a sea sponge is, and it not, does not have bilateral sym symmetry the way humans do. It has radial symmetry. All right, so a sea star is an example of a very primitive animal that, that has a hydrostatic skeleton. Now we move on to the cartilage fish, the, which are collectively referred to as the chondrichthians. So the sharks and stingrays and dogfish are all referred to as chondrichthians because they all have a cartilage skeleton. And then eventually, on the evolutionary scale, some of the cartilage fish evolved into ostichthians, which are called the bony fish, commonly called the bony fish. The bony fish are collectively called ostichthians, and these fish have a, have a skeleton made of bone instead of cartilage. And the conversion of cartilage to bone is, call, is a process called ossification. So you do need to know that word. The process of converting cartilage into bone by adding uh, calcium salts to the bone to the cartilage is called is a process called ossification 
it is sometimes referred to as mineralization because calcium is considered to be a mineral. Uh, if you know anything about chemistry, you know that minerals are uh, any elements that are classified as minerals are the elements that you generally dig out of the ground, right? So you dig iron out of the ground, you dig uh, other things out of the ground, copper, uh, zinc, tin, you dig those things out of the ground. And so uh, those are minerals. Calcium is also a mineral because generally you dig calcium out of the ground. It may not be in it, it may it may be in the form of calcium hydroxide or calcium uh, calcium sulfate or cal calcium phosphate, uh, but nevertheless, it, calcium is considered to be a mineral. So sometimes ossification is classified, or sometimes ossification is called mil mineralization. Uh, but it's but it it's referring to the conversion of cartilage to bone. Okay, so we first we had the chondrichthyan fish that had a cartilage skeleton. And some of those fish evolved into the bony fish, the ostichthians, which have a bony skeleton. And so humans obviously are, are have evolved from the bony fish a long time ago, the bony fish. And that's why we have a bony skeleton instead of a cartilage skeleton. Okay, now if, you ha if you're an animal that has your skeleton on the outside, you, are, you have an exoskeleton. If you have it on the inside, you have an endoskeleton. Okay, so here we have a crab, which is a crustacean. Uh, this is a tree crab, so in case you didn't know, not, not all crabs live in the ocean. Some of them live on land. But here you see that it has a hard shell on the outside. If you boil it and eat it for the purpose of eating it, you break the, 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 the exoskeleton off and you will not find another skeleton on the inside because its skeleton is on the outside. Humans, on the other hand, have an endoskeleton, which means that it's, under, it's inside the organism. Uh, it, that doesn't quite make any sense because uh, the best purpose for the skeleton is to provide support for the internal organs. You know, it keeps all the internal organs in their proper place, but it also is meant to provide protection from damage. So you can you can do a lot more damage to a crab without actually harming that crab than you can to a human, right? If you hit a crab with a hammer it may not break. If you hit a human with a hammer, there will definitely be some damage done. Now there is, there, there is, there are certain parts of the human skeleton that, that function for protection as well, and that specifically I'm talking about the rib cage. The rib cage is there and does a good job of protecting the lungs, which are particularly delicate. You know, the lungs are basically just balloons, and those balloons could be easily damaged if they were not protected by the ribs. So the rib cage is, is sometimes referred to as the thoracic cage, and I'll talk about that again in a minute. It's called the thoracic cage, and its function is to protect the lungs and also the heart to a lesser degree, but the lungs are particularly vulnerable to being squished or damaged or somehow. And so the thoracic cage does a good job of protecting the lungs, but generally speaking, the human skeleton doesn't do a lot of protection. The other example of uh, protection that by the human skeleton, which is an endoskeleton, is the skull. Right? So the skull is there to protect the brain. And the skull is some the, the part of the skull that contains the brain is sometimes referred to as the cranial vault. The cranial vault. And you know what a vault is. A vault is another word for a safe that you would find in a bank, you know, that has a combination lock on it and you keep all the money inside to protect it. That's called a vault. Well, the, the, the part of the human skull that, that contains the brain is called the cranial vault because its main purpose is to protect the brain from damage. And the brain is extremely delicate and extremely vulnerable to damage. Okay, so that's the difference between an endoskeleton and an exoskeleton. From a damage point of view, an, an exoskeleton is actually a lot better, uh, but humans don't have that. All right, so we talked about the endoskeleton. Uh, humans have an endoskeleton. The skeleton st starts out as cartilage, which is converted to bone, a process called ossification. Ossification is sometimes called mineralization. Mineralization and ossification are processes, is a process where calcium salts or, you know, calcium, uh, calcium compounds such as calcium hydroxide and calcium phosphate are added to the bone and have the effect of hardening it. All right, so, uh, the root word osteo or osseous refers to the bone or, or the skeletal system. 
Okay, the cells that the cell, uh, bone cells, whose uh, specific cells who are specialized to function in the skeletal system, are called osteocytes. As I mentioned, an osteoblast is an osteocyte that makes new bone tissue. An osteoclast is, a, is an osteocyte that destroys or takes bone tissue apart. The reason it does this is because you the, the concentration of calcium has dropped too low in your blood, and so you have to get some calcium out of the reserve bank. Now, obviously, this is a problem because you don't want to be taking your bones apart. You need them because you don't want your bones to become brittle. For this reason, it's critical that you get enough calcium in your diet so that the concentration of calcium in your blood does not drop to the point where the osteoblasts will start to take your bones apart to get calcium. So you, you, it's critical that you get enough calcium in your diet. You can get calcium from dairy products like milk and cheese that happen to be rich in calcium. However, uh, even that may not be enough. So I recommend that people take calcium supplements on a regular basis. You go to the drugstore and you can buy calcium in a bottle in pill form. So you just take some of these calcium pills every day. That, that Everyone should do that. But that's not quite the end of the story. The end of the story is that when you eat calcium, your intestine is unable to absorb the calcium without the help of vitamin D. Right? So you need vitamin D in order to absorb the calcium. Right? So make sure that you also take vitamin D every day. That's particularly important in a place like Canada because um, Canada does not get much sunlight. We're very far to the north and we don't get a lot of sunlight. Now, it, now, where do you normally get vitamin D? You might have heard that your body makes vitamin D in response to sunlight. So yes, sunlight is good for you. It's good to get out into the sun because then uh, uh, vitamin D is created in your skin when the skin gets hit by sunlight. So sunlight is good for you because it allows your body to create vitamin D. However, it's a trade-off. It's a double-edged sword because if you get too much sun, you could be vulnerable to skin cancer. Right now, uh, so you want to get enough sun that you get some vitamin D. You don't want to get too much sun that you get skin cancer. Um, uh, so it's a balance. It's probably easier and better to get your vitamin D from uh, from vitamin D pills that you would simply buy in the drugstore. Right, so I advise everybody to, to take calcium supplements, especially if you're female, because women have problems losing uh, bone tissue much faster as they get older. So it's more, it's important that everybody have enough calcium to support bone proper bone health, but it's much more important for women to, to uh, take care of that as well. And as I said, taking calcium pills is not enough. You also have to take vitamin D pills. Otherwise, your intestine can't absorb the calcium. You can make up, you can get some vitamin D by being out in the sun, but you're risking, the more you're out in the sun, the more risk you have of getting skin cancer. And also in places like Canada, we're very far to the north, so we don't get a lot of sun. So it makes more sense to simply take vitamin D pills. So among the pills you take every day, you should take some calcium and some vitamin D. All right, let's talk about the different types of bone tissue. I said we have two, two main types that are called compact bone versus uh, spongy bone or uh, cal calcinous bone. Okay, so we have compact bone and we have spongy bone. Spongy bone is also called ca uh, cancellous bone. All right, now this is, this is the femur. The femur is the bone that you have in your upper leg. Right. Now, the femur is composed, like many bones, are composed of both compact bone as well as spongy bone. You notice that the two ends of the femur, this is the end that connects with your hip bone, and this is the end that connects with the knee. The hip, the, the end, this upper end of the uh, femur that connects with the hip bone is made of spongy bone or cal cancellous bone. And you notice that it has red coloring inside. Now the reason for that, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, but the reason for that is because that is where your blood is formed. Uh, human blood cells, red blood cells and white blood cells are formed inside spongy cancellous bone. Blood cells are not formed within compact bone. 
Okay, so spongy bone is less strong than compact bone and it has a kind of a spongy appearance because it has lots of pores in it. Pores are little pockets, little hollow spaces. Those are pores. Right, so you know that a sponge has lots of pores in it. That's how it's able to absorb the water. Right, so spongy bone has pores in it and the function of those pores is that they're filled with what's called bone marrow. Bone marrow is a type of cell and those bone marrow cells are what are what develop into red and white blood cells. Right? So that process of converting bone marrow stem cells into red and white blood cells is called hematopoiesis and I'll show you how to spell that in a minute. But blood cell creation occurs in the spongy bone. Now if we look at the other part of the middle part of the of the femur, you notice that it's hollow on the inside and that hollow part is called the medullary cavity, the medullary cavity. Usually if you talk about the outside part of a, of a body part, you call that the cortex. So the outer part of a piece of the, uh, of any, you know, a bone or an organ, the outer part is usually referred to as the cortex, the cortex, and the inner part is usually referred to as the medulla, the medulla. Now, in the case of the femur, the medulla of the femur, the central inner part, is hollow and it is filled with bone marrow, this yellow stuff here. So if you've ever, you know, if you've ever, I know many of you are vegetarians and so you would avoid this kind of thing, but if you've ever broken open a beef bone, the bone from a cow or the bone from a, a chicken, you would have seen this, this yellow stuff on the inside. Uh, let's say you were preparing a meal or something or you, you got a bone from the butcher to give to your dog. Um, when I was young, we had lots of dogs. We had lots of pet dogs and we used to go to the butcher shop every, every week and get spare bones. The butcher would give us the bones uh, and we'd take them home and give them to the dog and the dog would chew on the bones until they managed to break open the bone and then they would lick all of this yellow marrow out of the inside of the bone. That's, that's really what, do that's, that's the only reason why dogs chew on bones because they're trying to break them open and get the marrow out because uh, the marrow is, is an adipose tissue that's very rich in energy, so dogs love that. So on the inside of the femur, you have this yellow bone marrow. Now there are two types of bone marrow. There is yellow bone marrow and red bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow, which you would find inside the medullary cavity of the femur, for instance, the yellow bone marrow is only fat. It's fat cells, it's adipose cells. And what are adipose cells filled with? You remember? They're filled with triglyceride. Okay, so those are not, that is not the kind of bone marrow that that uh, human blood cells are made out of. The blood cells are created from the red bone marrow and the red bone marrow is found within the spongy bone. Okay, so be clear on the fact that we have two types of bone marrow that is found within bones. Yellow bone marrow is simply fat tissue for energy storage and red bone marrow is uh, what, what are called hematopoietic stem cells, which are used to, to generate or uh, blood cells, red and white blood cells develop from red bone marrow. So there's a difference. You find yellow bone marrow inside the hollow compartments of, of uh, compact bone, and you find red bone marrow inside uh, cancellous bone, spongy bone. Now the compact bones are made of very compact systems called osteons. Osteons are also referred to as Haversian systems because it was invented or discovered or named by a, by a scientist named Havers. Uh, and then the, the, the uh, spongy bone, the calcinous bone, is made of slightly weaker uh, networks of, of bone fibers called trabeculae. trabeculae. Okay, so compact bone. I just showed you that the femur is made of both compact and spongy bone. It's compact in the middle, the middle part, and it's spongy on the end. Okay, so compact bone is strong and dense. It's organized into ring structures that are called osteons, also known as Haversian systems. And generally there's a, there's a tunnel that runs down the center of this circular osteon where blood vessels and nerves can run down this tunnel and the tunnel is called a Haversian canal. So here we have a drawing of, uh, of a piece of compact bone. 
this is actually meant to be a cross section through the femur where you have the hollow space on the inside. And then we have popped out on the left, we have popped out one of the osteons for us to look at. So you can see that it's a, it's a circular system that looks like a long tube. It's made of concentric rings of lamella. Lamella means tissue. Uh, tissue. Uh, concentric means rings within rings within rings. And then in the very center, we have a tunnel that runs down the middle that has a vein, that's the blue thing, and an artery, that's the red thing, running down the middle of it, running down the middle of it, right? So there may also be a nerve that runs down the middle of a Haversian canal. Uh, that's why when you break a bone, it hurts, because what you've done is you've compressed uh, you've pinched the nerves that run through the Haversian canals. So when you break a bone, you've caused pressure to be exerted on the nerves that run through the Haversian canals. And whenever you press or, or you put pressure on a nerve, that usually causes pain. That's what they talk about when they say that you pinched a nerve. Uh, you put pressure on a nerve that causes pain. And so there are nerves that run through the bone tissue. And they, the nerves, along with some uh, arteries and veins, run through the Haversian canals of each osteon. Okay, here's a top view of an osteon. You can see the Haversian canal in the middle. That's the dark part. And then you can see the concentric rings of lamella around the outside. So if you saw something that looked like this, obviously you would know that you're looking at bone tissue. All right, let's move on to spongy cancellous bone. It is weaker and lighter. Uh, it's not as dense. It contains red marrow, red bone marrow, where this word hematopoiesis takes place. You need to know this word. Hematopoiesis is the process by which uh, red bone marrow cells are converted to red and white blood cells that circulate in the blood. So you know that we have blood that's filled with red and white blood cells, those cells originated in the bone marrow. They originated inside spongy bone. And the process of conversion of bone marrow cells to blood cells, red and white blood cells, is called hematopoiesis. And the cells, another technical term for those red bone marrow cells, another technical term is hematopoietic stem cells. Right, so you might have heard in the popular media or in the news, you've heard about stem cells. Well, when they talk about stem cells, that's what they're talking about. That's often what they're talking about. There are other types of stem cells in the body, that, uh, such as embryonic stem cells. So when a, a developing embryo, uh, you have a fertilized egg, like you take an egg and a sperm, you fertilize them, then you, that creates something called a zygote. The zygote develops an, an, into an embryo, which is a very, very rudimentary human being. Uh, that embryo is made of things called embryonic stem cells. So what we're talking about here is the other type of stem cell, which is called a hematopoietic stem cell. Uh, the difference between an embryonic stem cell and a hematopoietic stem cell, and we will, we will discuss this later in the course, the difference between a hematopoietic stem cell and an embryonic stem cell is that a hematopoietic stem cell is limited to, de to develop, being able to develop only into a red or a white blood cell, right? So a hematopoietic stem cell can only develop into a, one of the two types of blood cells. An embryonic stem cell can develop into any type of cell in the human body. Right? So that is the main difference between a hematopoietic stem cell and an embryonic stem cell. An embryonic stem cell can turn into or develop into anything, whereas a hematopoietic stem cell can only develop into one of the various types of blood cells. So that would be a good essay question for the final exam. Tell me the difference between hematopoietic stem cells and, and embryonic stem cells. All right, so now the spongy ca uh, cancellous bone is not organized into osteons. It's organized into slightly weaker structures called trabeculae. Trabeculae. And the trabeculae is the plural word. The singular word is trabecula. Trabecula. All right, so here we have trabeculae uh, forming the inside of spongy tissue. So here's the head of the femur that attaches to your hip, and that's one of the places where hematopoiesis takes place. And so this, the, the head of the femur is made of spongy 
bone, not compact bone. Therefore, when people fall, um, people fall and break a bone in their leg, it's usually that. It's usually the head of the femur that breaks, particularly in elderly people, because it's made of spongy bone instead of compact bone. Compact bone is generally stronger than spongy bone, so if you have elderly people that fall, slip and fall on the floor and break their hip, that's usually where it broke in the, in the head of the femur because the trabecular bone is much weaker than the compact bone. Okay, here is a dissected uh, head of a femur. You can see it's all red because it's filled with red bone marrow. The red bone marrow is red because it's developing into red blood cells. So blood, one of the sources of blood in the human body is the head of the femurs. We have two of those, the head of the femurs. All right, these are the other places in the human body where hematopoiesis takes place. Hematopoiesis takes place inside many of the spongy uh, of the areas that are made of spongy uh, spongy bone uh, tissue, cancellous tissue, and the main places where that's true are the heads of the two femurs, right? the pelvic bones, the the hip bones. That's another place. The head of the humerus, the two humeri. The humerus is the bone in the upper arm. The spinal column. Hematopoiesis is taking place in the spinal vertebrae. Vertebrae are the little pieces that make up the, the backbone. And hematopoiesis also takes place in the ribs, in the ribs. And hematopoiesis also takes place in the skull, right? So I, I could ask you on a test, name three places where hematopoiesis takes place. Name three places in the skeletal system where red blood cells are formed, something like that or name three places in the in the skeleton in the human skeleton where you have flat uh, where you have spongy bone right where you have spongy bone I forgot to mention also this bone right here at the center of the rib cage called the sternum we're going to talk about the sternum later that's another spot where uh, hematopoiesis takes place okay so these are the areas in the adult human being where hematopoiesis takes place Okay, so ossification is the process of converting cartilage into bone. You put calcium salts into, into the cartilage, which has the effect of hardening it. An osteoblast creates bone, it's, and, and then eventually it develops into a less active form of a bone cell, just called an osteocyte. But as I said, the term osteocyte is the general term in general for both osteoblast and osteoclast. It, it simply means a bone cell. And an osteoclast breaks down uh, uh, the bone marrow in order to get calcium out. That's part of calci calcium uh, homeostasis. Right now, how do you? An easy way to memorize the the word blast, osteoblast. So you you remember the word osteo as relating to bones. A blast. Just imagine this thing exploding. Imagine one of these cells exploding and making lots of uh, making lots of bone tissue. Okay, the word clast. Have you ever heard the word iconoclast? An icon is usually refers to a person or a thing that, that is revered. Uh, some very big important person, for instance, a, a famous leader, political leader or something would be an icon. And what is an iconoclast? An iconoclast is a person who doesn't respect authority, right? They don't like authority and they spend a lot of their time making fun of icons. They make, they, they make jokes about, about important political leaders and make fun of them and make them belittle them and make them seem small. And so the job of an iconoclast is to take apart or deflate an icon. Whereas an osteoclast is a cell that does the same thing. It takes apart bone, bone and makes it smaller and lesser. But it does this for the purpose of, of, of liberating calcium and putting it into the blood. Okay, bone remodeling is the combination, the collective term to putting bone tissue together versus taking it apart. This process is controlled by hormones that are produced by the endocrine system. And we'll talk about those when we're talking about the endocrine system. So whether or not the iconoclasts are working harder than the iconoblasts or vice versa, that is controlled by hormones. As it happens, when we get older, those hormones begin to diminish. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, we produce less hormones that cause growth of the bone. And then we have decline of the bone. The bones become thinner and more brittle.
uh, as a result of age, and that, that is the result of slowing down of the endocrine system. So bone mass refers to the amount of basically how much bone do you have? How much bone do you have? Uh, so peak bone mass is where is related to the fact that bones will stop growing. They'll stop adding mass about five years after we stop growing vertically. Uh, I mentioned that I stopped growing vertically when I was 16. So that means five years later, I, I reached my peak bone mass at about approximately age 21. And, and I have been declining ever since. We lose bone matter about at a rate of about 1% or 2% per year after that. Osteoporosis is a condition where you have a risk of breaking a bone. You have a risk of a bone fracture. And so this technically you, you, you have osteoporosis when you've lost when you have less than 50% of your peak bone mass. So you can see that if you live long enough, almost everybody has osteoporosis if they live long enough. So pretty much everybody in their 80s has osteoporosis. And so we have to be very careful with people that are that age uh, to not put them in any situations where they may fall down and break a bone. So this chart, this graph represents the typical bone mass of men and women as they age. Right, so, so you can see on the on the vertical axis, the y-axis, that this total bone mass is measured in uh, the total amount of total amount of calcium in the skeleton measured in grams. Right, so a man at peak bone mass has about 1.5 kilograms of calcium stored in their bones. As you get older, the amount of calcium stored in the bones declines, and the amount of bones that you have in total declines. Okay, so you see here that both men and women reach their peak bone mass in their early, early to mid 20s. And then the amount of bone mass they have starts to decline. Now notice that there's a sharp decline in, in bone mass in the, 40, in the late 40s, early 50s for women. And that is a result of a change in hormones called menopause. Right, so loss of bone due to menopause in women is a serious problem. Right. So at age 50, women's bones start to become very brittle all of a sudden, suddenly. Right? And so when you get to be 80 or 90 or 100, you notice that there's a big discrepancy in the amount of bone matter left, the amount of bone mass that men and women have left. Men generally have more, women have less. And so we always have to be very careful with elderly women in particular because they are very vulnerable to having a broken bone if they fall or, or if they're hit with something. There are extreme cases of very elderly women who've had all the ha who have had the bones in their hands broken by somebody shaking their hand too vigorously. Uh, you know, shaking be shaking somebody's hand too enthusiastically. If it's a very elderly woman, you could actually break the bones in her hand. So uh, this is one thing, this is why we always have to be careful with el elderly people and never put them in a situation where they may fall. They always have to make sure they grip onto the hand railing when they're going up and down stairs. If they fall, it would be a disaster. Um, a young person in their 20s falls down the stairs. They get some bruises, that, that hurts, but they're fine after a day or two. They didn't break any bones. Uh, an elder, elderly person falls down the stairs. They could break several bones, and once those bones are broken, they may never heal properly. They may never heal properly because they, their iconoblasts, or their, sorry, their osteoblasts are not very active. So uh, breaking the bone is, the, the increased risk of breaking a bone when you're elderly is bad enough. But once you've broken a bone, you have a very hard time fixing the bone. Okay, so this is this is an example of osteoporosis. If we look at the head of the femur here, you see that in a young person, the bone matrix has very small pores, which means that there's a lot of bone mass there. In the elderly person, the pores are very large because there's not very much bone there, and so that is porosis, osteo referring to bone, porosis meaning enlarged pores. So if, you, if your bone tissue has a lot of large pores, it can be easily broken because it doesn't have as much strength. And so that's why we do all kinds of things in society to, to prevent putting elderly people in situations where they may fall and break those bones. Uh, that's why if you ride the bus, you notice that there are seats at the front of the bus that say courtesy seats. And it says, please allow elderly people to sit here. That's, that's because 
if an elderly person gets on the bus and they try to walk all the way to the back of the bus, or they have to, if they have to stand up or walk farther to get a seat, and the bus suddenly lurches to a stop and they fall over, they could break a bone and they could never recover from that. They may never recover from that. On the other hand, if a young person has to stand and the bus lurches to a stop and they fall and they hit the floor, they get, they get a bruise and the bruise disappears in a couple of days. Um, they don't have to worry about it. But an elderly person could break a hip bone or break the femur, the head of their femur, and it may never heal again. And that's, uh, you know that uh, you, if you look at a young person, they can move around quite easily. If you look at an, a very elderly person, you notice that they're walking with a walker or with a cane or two canes or something like that. You know that the transition from being a person who's mobile and healthy to a person who's elderly and immobile doesn't happen gradually. It happens in, in discrete, it's a result of discrete events, right? So. A person goes from a, a middle-aged person who can walk normally to an elderly person who walks with a limp and has to use a cane. That happens usually as a result of breaking something. So if you can, if you can, a, if you can get into advanced age without having broken anything, you stand a much better chance of have of having a good, fulfilling, healthy life as an elderly person. So the trick, the trick is to age health to 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 age in a healthy, mobile manner. The trick is to avoid breaking bones. Uh, at all costs, right? So that's one of the main reasons why we try to keep elderly people out of situations where they might fall and break something. Okay, let's talk about the important parts of the human skeleton. Okay, first of all, we divide the human skeleton up into two special units. One of them is called the axial skeleton. If you know what an axis is, an axis is usually kind of a long, thin tube that other things rotate around, right? So if you have a central piece, that would be called the axis. And so the central skeleton, which consists of the head, the spinal cord, the sternum, the sacrum and the, the, or the skull part of the head, that is referred to as the axial skeleton, the central part. And then the arms and the legs that you stick on to the axial skeleton are referred to as appendages. And so we call the arms and the legs that we stick on to the axial skeleton, we call that the appendicular skeleton. We refer to that as the, collectively as the appendicular skeleton. So the axial skeleton refers to the skull, the vertebral column, the ribs, and the sternum, as well as the sacrum, which we'll talk about. The sacrum is part of the, of the uh, spinal column. And the appendicular skeleton in, it, uh, consists of the limbs, the limbs, which means the arms and the legs. So here we have the axial skeleton composed of the skull, the spinal cord, the ribs, and the sacrum, which is down here at the bottom of the, of the spinal column. And, and notice I mentioned before the thoracic cage, this part of the axial skeleton has a special name. We call it the thoracic cage because it's part of the thorax and its purpose is to protect the lungs mainly, but also the heart to a certain extent. Now, one thing to notice before I move on about the ribs, note these red, this red stuff, this red coloration here is meant to be cartilage, right? Cartilage. The ribs are made of bone the sternum, the central, the, what's commonly called the breastbone, the sternum is made of bone, but the ribs are not directly attached to the sternum. They are indirectly attached through cartilage. Right? So the, the ribs are not continuous with the sternum. They are attached to the sternum, but they're not, con, they're not continuously attached to the sternum. They're attached through an intermediate piece of cartilage. Okay, now the appendicular skeleton there are two parts to the appendicular skeleton. The, the, the bones that connect the arms to the, uh, to the skeleton, to the appendicular, uh, sorry, the, the bones that connect the arms to the skeleton are referred to as the pectoral girdle. And the bones that connect the legs to the skeleton are called the pelvic girdle, right? So be clear on what, what the pectoral girdle is and what the pelvic girdle is. Just remember when we talked about the body compartments, I showed you where the I, I showed you where the pelvic compartment is. And so the pelvic girdle is located near the pelvic compartment. The pectoral girdle, the word pectoral refers to the upper chest, right? So the pectoral girdle is where the the arm the the arms are collected to the connected to the axial skeleton at the shoulders. Okay, so here we have what's commonly called the shoulder girdle, but which is technically called the pectoral girdle. 
right? So I could ask you what the pectoral girdle is, or I could ask you what is the technical term for the shoulder girdle. I could ask you anything like that on a test. And then down here at the hips, it is commonly referred to the hip the hip joints where the hips attach uh, the hips attach the legs to the to the axial skeleton is referred to as the as the pelvic girdle. All right, now, if you take all the bones in the human skeleton, there are five general types of bones. We already said that there are two types of bone tissue, compact bone and, and spongy bone, cancellous bone. But that tells you what the bones are made of. It doesn't tell you anything about the shape. Okay, so if you take the shapes of the various bones that comprise the human skeleton, there, they can be classified into five general shapes. And again, this could be something I ask you about on a test. And those, those five shapes are long bones, like the femur that I just showed you is a good example of a long bone. The flat bones, typically the bones of the skull and the bones, the, the sternum are two examples of flat bones. So are the hip bones, by the way. Short bones, typically we're talking about little bones that are about one centimeter by one centimeter and they're usually square in shape. And a good example of those are the carpal bones that are found in your wrist. Irregular bones have are odd shapes that have things sticking out all over the place. Typical example of irregular bones are the spinal vertebra. The vertebra are the spine are the little pieces, the individual little pieces that form the spine. And then finally, sesamoid bones. If you've ever seen a sesame seed, if you've ever eaten a sesame sesame snap or something like that, a sesame seed is a little tiny oval-shaped seed. Uh, there are only a couple of bones in the human body that are sesamoid in shape, and the, the, most, uh, the most common one is the patella, which is commonly called the kneecap. And so you know there's a little bone on the front part of your knee, on the anterior surface of your knee, that's called the, that is called the kneecap. That's the common name. The technical name for that bone is the patella, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so let's have a look. Okay, so the femur that comes from the leg is a good example of a long bone. The sternum, which is found at the center of the chest, is a good example of a flat bone. The skull bones are also good examples of flat bones. The spinal vertebra that make up the spinal cord are good examples of irregular bones. The bones that make up the carpals in your wrist and the tarsals in your ankles, they're usually small bones that are square in shape, roughly cub cub cuboid in shape, cubical uh, in shape are the short bones. And then the kneecap, the bone that protects the anterior surface of your knee, the front surface of your knee is called the patella. And that's a good example of a sesamoid bone. In fact, it's the only example of a sesamoid bone. All right, let's get to the human skeleton and memorize all the main bones in the human skeleton. You are responsible for memorizing this. I could ask any of these bones on a test. All right, so we see our skeleton on the, on the left. The skeleton is standing in anatomical position with, it, with its feet facing forward and its palm facing forward, except that the right hand, the skeleton's right hand, is facing the wrong way. The left hand is actually facing in, in proper anatomical position, right? So pay attention to this hand, not the other one. All right, so you know where the skull is. The skull is up here. The mandible is the technical name for the jawbone. The mandible is the jawbone. The little pieces that make up the spinal column are called vertebra, so therefore we refer to the backbone as the vertebral column. You know where the ribs are. Right? You know where the sternum is. Right? The sternum, this central part here, also commonly called the breastbone. All right, the clavicle. The clavicle is commonly called the collarbone. Right? This is the clavicle. The scapula is commonly called the shoulder blade. Now let me ask you, is the shoulder blade, well let me ask you first, is the clavicle on the anterior or the posterior side of the human body? If you feel your own collarbone, you'll know the answer. Right? The clavicle is on the anterior side. All right, what side of the body are your shoulder blades on? The shoulder blades are on the posterior side of the body, right? So they're on the back side of the body. Okay, the humerus refers to the arm, the, the upper arm bone, this large bone in the upper arm. That's the humerus. Not funny at all. 
Not, nothing to do with laughing. Humorous. All right, now there are two bones in the, if you look at the, at the forearm, the lower arm, there are two bones there, right? They are called the radius and the ulna. Okay, the, if you look at this, if you look at this arm, if you look at this arm that is in proper anatomical position, the radius is the, is the bone that is on the same side as the thumb. That's the best way to memorize which one is which. If, the, if and only if the skeleton is in proper anatomical position, which we assume that it is when we refer to the, to the location of bones, if the skeleton is in, if the body is in standard anatomical position with the palm of the hand facing forward, the radius is the bone that is on the same side with the thumb. The other bone, the ulna, is on the same side as the little finger. Right? So, so we have the radius and the ulna, which are the two bones that make, make up the lower arm, also called the forearm. And the radius and the ulna are almost the same size. They're almost the same thickness. Right? Now you'll see when you look at the lower leg that there are two bones there called the tibia and the fibula, that are, one of them is much thinner than the other. The fibula is much thinner than the tibia. So when, you, when we're going to start, when we look at x-rays, I'm going to ask you to identify which bones we're looking at based on just the shape of the bones. One way to tell if you're looking at the lower leg is and which one is the fibula versus the tibia is that the fibula is quite a bit thinner than the tibia. That is not true of the of the lower arm, not true of the forearm. The radius and the ulna are nearly the same size, so you have to look for other clues about which bone it is. All right, the carpals the carpals are the bones in your wrist, right? in the bones in your wrist. Okay, you might have heard the term, did you ever see a movie called The Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams? Uh, it's one of my favorite movies. Robin Williams plays a teacher who's trying to teach his students how to appreciate life. And he tells his students to appreciate life by carpe diem. Carpe diem is a Latin phrase that translates as seize the day. Right? And seize the day uh, is not quite a good translation because the Latin word carpe, carpe refers to grabbing something by closing with the help of your wrist. Right? So carpe is the Latin word meaning to close your wrist. So you grab something, you seize something, you grab hold of it. Right? So in the, in the case of the movie The Dead Poet okay. Society and the expression carpe diem, Diem means is Latin for day. Seize the day means don't be timid. It means grab, be bold and grab your dreams. Right? So that's what carpe diem means. But the word carpe refers to the wrist. Right? So the carpals, that's an easy way to remember that the carpals refer to your wrist. You've probably also heard of a, a, an illness called carpal tunnel syndrome. The, the carpal bones in your wrist form something called a tunnel. And through, they're kind of, you know, they're arranged around the wrist. And through the center of that carpal tunnel runs some veins and arteries and some nerves. And so if the area inside the carpal tunnel becomes inflamed, if it becomes irritated and swollen, the swollen tissue will put pressure on the nerve. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, if you put pressure on a nerve, mechanical pressure on a nerve, it will cause pain. That results in the sensation of pain. So carpal tunnel syndrome is where the tissue inside your wrist becomes swollen. And that has the effect of pinching or putting pressure on the medial nerve, which causes pain in your hands. It causes you to feel pain in your hands. So, Carpal tunnel syndrome is a problem with the wrist. I'm sure you probably know that. And carpe diem contains the word carpe, which means to seize, to grab something with the help of your wrist. So the carpal bones are the, are the term for all of these bones that are in your wrist. You're not required to memorize the names of any of the carpal bones in this course. But if you take, I should mention, by the way, that if you take Biology 130, Biology 130 is called Anatomy and Physiology, uh, I, I teach you uh, the names of all the carp carpal bones. Right? So if you do, if you take Biology 100, I should tell you that if you decide to take 130, Biology 130, after you've taken Biology 100, you'll probably do better in Biology 130 because we've gone through some of the elementary anatomy for this course. 
So in Biology 130, we're, do, we're talking about the same things that we talk about in this course, except in a lot more detail. And so you are, you're already being forced to learn some of the detail here. So if you take Biology 130, you will, you will have already learned some of the things that we teach in Biology 130. And so you'll be at an advantage relative to students who haven't taken Biology 100. Okay, so the carpals are the, in, in Biology 130, I will force you to learn all the names of all, all the carpal bones. Uh, but in, in this course, we don't, right? Now, the word meta, meta, means beyond. It kind of means above or beyond, right? So the metacarpals are the bones that are in the palm of your hand, and they're called metacarpals because they're located beyond the carpal bones, right? So those are the metacarpals. The metacarpals are here, the bones right in your palm, right? The bones in your palm, those are the metacarpals. All right, now the bones in your fingers are referred to as phalanges, right? And in individual, the, the word phalanges is plural, multiple, right? And an individual unit inside the phalanges is referred to as a phalanx, a phalanx. Okay, we'll talk about that because we're, we will actually mention phalanxes. Okay, so now, as I said, the pelvic girdle is where the legs are attached to the axial skeleton. Right. The pelvic bones refer to the hip bones. Right. The femur is the long bone in the upper leg. We already talked about the structure of the head of the femur and how it's composed of spongy uh, bone tissue where hematopoiesis takes place, among other things. The patella is the name for the bone that covers the anterior surface of the knee, commonly called the kneecap. Now the tibia and the fibula are the two bones in the lower leg. So the tibia is the thicker of the two, and most of the weight of the body is placed on the tibia, not the fib, fib, uh, fibula. The fibula is much thinner and is much more easily broken. So if somebody breaks, their lower, breaks a bone in their lower leg, nine times out of ten it's going to be the fibula because it's much thinner and weaker than the tibia. Uh, if, you, if the tibia becomes broken, usually the fib, fibula is broken as well. Okay, then... All the little tiny bones that are in the ankle are referred to as the tarsals, right? And then the bones beyond the tarsals that are in the main part of your foot are called the metatarsals for the same reason we call the metacarpals the metacarpals, so the metatarsals. And then unfortunately the bones inside the toes are also referred to as phalanges and each individual bone in a toe is called a phalanx. Okay, so the problem is that they're both the, the, the bones in the fingers and the toes are both called phalanges. Individually, they're called a phalanx. And so you have to specify whether you're talking about the phalanges in the fingers or the phalanges in the, in the toes. All right, those are the important bones of the human body. Now let's just mention the fact that there are 12 pairs of ribs. So if you count them, there are 12 pairs. And notice that 10 of those 12 pairs are attached to the sternum using this cartilage, the cartilage, okay? And then there are two pairs at the very bottom that are not attached to the sternum. We call those the, the two pairs of floating ribs, floating ribs because they're not attached in any way to the sternum, right? So I could ask you what, what floating ribs are. I could ask you how many pairs of floating ribs. When I say pairs, I mean that there's a left one and a right one, right? So how many pairs of floating ribs do we have? The answer is two. Uh, why do you call them floating ribs? Because they're not attached to the sternum. Okay, so on the left we have an anterior view of the body of the thoracic cage and on the right we have a posterior view. So you can see that the the clavicle is on the anterior side of the body, so is the sternum. Right? And on the posterior side of the body, we have the two scapulae. So this is, a, this is the right scapula, this is the left scapula. By the way, when you refer to right and left for the skeleton, you're referring to the skeleton's right and left. Right? So that's why I say that this is the right, this is the, this is, well, if you're looking at an anterior view of the skeleton, this is the, uh, this is the right arm. Right, so this is the right arm over here because we're talking about the skeleton's right arm. We're not talking about our our right or left. Okay, so once again, so we have these various parts. There's the humerus, and then the radius and the ulna, right? And then we have the carpals, 
metacarpals in the wrist, we have the metacarpals in the hand itself, and then we have the phalanges in the fingers. Each individual phalange is called a phalanx and it has a specific name. All right, so here is, so as I said, the individual phalanges, the indiv an individual bone that forms part of the phalanges is called a phalanx, a phalanx. Right now, some of you, if you study history or something like that, if you study Greek or Roman history, you may you may know that a phalanx is a Greek word for a row, a row or a line of soldiers. Right, so somebody thought that a bone in the finger looks like a line of soldiers in line or something. I, I have no idea why, but that's what they're that's what they named them. Okay, so in in biology 130, in this course, we're not going to force you to learn the names of all of the <coughs> metacarpals but we do in 130. In 100, we don't force you to memorize the names of all the metacarpals or anything. Uh, but there is, in 130, we, we teach you how to name each bone in the, in the fingers. So uh, this, and I'm just gonna run through it here because it's a good reinforcement of the idea of proximal and distal. Okay, notice that the index finger, the first index finger here, what you do when you name the bones, the, the phalanx bones, is you take every finger and you give it a number one through five. The thumb is number one, right? So the, the, the index finger, the finger that you use to point with, is actually number two, right? Now notice that within the index finger, we have three individual phalanxes. There's one that's close to the hand, there's one that's in the middle, and there's one that's farthest from the hand. Okay, so this bone that's closest to the body is called the second proximal phalanx. This one that's farthest from the hand is called the second distal phalanx. Right? And the one that's in the middle is called the second medial phalanx. Right? So then here we have the third proximal phalanx, the third distal phalanx, and way over here we have the fifth proximal phalanx and the fifth distal phalanx. So I just mentioned that. I don't get you, I, I don't force you to memorize that in this course. I will force you to memorize it if you take biology 130. But that just a reinforcement of the idea of the terms. How do you understand the terms distal and proximal? So distal refers to whichever piece is farthest from the body. Proximal means closer to the body. So re, the so the fingers have every one of the fingers has a distal phalanx and a proximal phalanx. Notice that the thumb only has two two phalanxes making it up, right? So the, there's, a prox, there's a proximal phalanx, there's the first proximal phalanx and the, and the first distal phalanx, there is no first medial phalanx. And the, the same thing applies to the, toe, the big toe. The big toe is, the, is, is considered toe number one, and it's composed of only two, two phalanges, uh, whereas the other four toes are composed of three. Okay, so here we have the femur again. Right. Here we have the tibia and the fibula, and we have the tarsals, the metatarsals, and then the phalanges. Okay, another word or two about the spine. We, the spi all of the vertebra in the spine are divided up into sections. Right. So the 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 the, the spinal vertebra that make up the part the, the that make up your neck. If you, the, the proper anatomical term for the neck is the cervical area, the cervix. Now you might've heard the term cervix with related to the female reproductive system that women have a cervix at the base of their uterus. That's true. And the word cervix means nar a narrow part or a narrow neck in Latin. Right, so then in the human body, we have two, actually have two cervices. So the, 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 ver the neck is also referred to as a cervix. Okay, so the, the human neck is composed of seven cervical vertebra, right? So if I ask you where the cervical vertebra are, you would say in the neck, right? So those are those vertebra that form, the seven vertebra that form the neck or the cervix are given a letter and a number, numbers one through seven. So C1 through C7 are the seven cervical vertebra that make up the neck. It is, it is critical that you know that. Okay, so you do need to know that. Okay, then we have 12 vertebra that are that are basically on the on the posterior side of the thorax. Right, so they are labeled T1. This is actually a little bit misleading. T1 through T12, not TH. Right, so T1 through T12 are the 12 thoracic vertebra. Right, 
Right, so we have 12 thoracic vertebra, and by the way, every one of these vertebra has a, has a pair of ribs coming out of it. Right, so the the ribs, the 12 pairs of ribs are attached to the 12 cervical vertebra. Right, now, the the when two bones or two joints come together and form a joint, the technical term for that is called an articulation. Articulation. And the, 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 and so you say that the ribs are, the, you say that the ribs articulate with the thoracic vertebra. The ribs articulate with the thoracic vertebra. Right? So the cervical vertebra do not articulate with the ribs. Just only the thoracic vertebra articulate with the ribs. All right. Now, if you go below the thoracic vertebra, you have five vertebra that are called the lumbar vertebra lumbar vertebra so we have the lumbar vertebra down here the thoracic vertebrae in the middle and the cervical vertebra up here right and then so the lumbar vertebra are the strongest vertebra in your body because when you're standing upright a lot of the weight of your thorax the weight of your upper body is born brought to bear on the lumbar vertebra so when people develop back problems when they get older it's usually a problem with the muscles that are attached to the lumbar vertebra that are being compressed and causing pain okay so the the lumbar vertebra do not articulate with the ribs they have they're by themselves okay now below the lumbar vertebra we have something called the sacrum the sacrum is actually made out of uh, six pairs of uh, vertebra that have become fused together so it's a solid it is now a solid piece it became fused several hundred million years ago during evolution okay at the very bottom of the at the very bottom of the sacrum we have a little tiny bone called the coccyx see the word coccyx and the coccyx is commonly referred to as the tailbone and if you fall down and you break that, it's extremely painful. It's excruciatingly painful. Some people are born with a coccyx that is coccyx that's too long and it's constantly poking at the tissue underneath and causing pain. Uh, people like that tend to slouch because if they sit up straight, it's painful. You can have the coccyx removed, but it's painful to have it removed because you have to, you know, the surgeon has to cut inside there and then sew it back up and that's, it's very painful. Um, um, so it's a uh, coccyx is a is a bone that sometimes causes us problems. Okay, here's something interesting. Uh, this is on the right. We have a diagram of the skin of, on the human body, which is divided up into a bunch of little bands running from side to side that are referred to as dermatones, and we're going to talk about that later during the ner nervous system discussion. So the dermatones are little areas of the body. Each dermatone contains its own set of nerves so that if you touch the skin in that area, only a particular set of nerves will be stimulated. Right? Those nerves that are stimulated, if you touch that particular part of the body, those nerves enter the spinal cord through one particular vertebra. So if you look at this diagram, you notice here that you see here the letters T1, the letter and the number T1. That means that the nerves, when you feel something touch that part of your skin, the nerves that convey that signal to the brain enter the body through the first uh, thoracic vertebra. Right. If you touch the skin here, the nerves that carry that signal to the body enter the spinal cord and start heading up towards the brain through the first lumbar vertebra. Right. If you touch something with your if you touch something with your middle finger or your index finger, the nerves that carry that signal to the brain enter the spinal column at C7, cervical vertebra number seven. Right. So if you're a neurosurgeon or you're a neurologist and, and you have people who have nerve damage, you, you learn all about that sort of thing. Which which nerves carry signals from which parts of the body to the brain and vice versa. All right, let's talk for a minute about the, the skull and the teeth within the skull. Okay, so the very front bone of the skull is called the frontal plate or the frontal bone. Right? Then we have a parietal bone, which is this one here, parietal, parietal bone. We have a temporal bone, which is located here, temporal bone. And we have an occipital bone, which is located here. 
at the back. Now you can't really see it from the skull at this angle, but the skull, the skull plates, the bones of the human skull, there is only one occipital bone and there's only one, uh, one frontal bone, but there are actually two parietal bones, one on each side. And there are two temporal bones, one on each side, right? So we have, we have a single frontal bone, a single occipital bone, and two parietal bones and two temporal bones, right? The upper part of the jaw above, above your upper teeth is referred to as the maxilla. That's part of the skull. And the jaw bone, the lower part of the jaw, is called the mandible, right? So you're responsible for all of those terms. Now, just as a matter of curiosity, these bones that are in the skull, the frontal bone, the occipital bone, the parietal bone, and the temporal bone are named after the structures of the brain, which they protect. So here we have a brain. This part of the brain is called the frontal lobe, and it's protected by the frontal bone of the skull. This part of the brain is called the temporal lobe, and it's protected by the temporal bone of the skull. This part is called the parietal lobe, and this, car, this part back here is called the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe protected by the occipital bone. The occipital lobe of the skull, uh, sorry, the occipital lobe of the brain is responsible for interpreting visual information. So when you see something, the signal is received by the eyes, but the signal is sent back here to the occipital lobe of the brain in order to figure out what, what you're looking at. Right? So the occipital part of your brain is responsible for visual information. If you had damage to your occipital lobe, you might be blind even though there's nothing wrong with your eyes. Your eyes could be perfectly fine, but if you had damage to the occipital part of the occipital lobe of the brain, you would not see anything. Let's move on to the teeth. Okay, these sharp teeth, these sharp flat teeth in the front of your mouth are referred to as the incisors. Incisors are used to bite chunks of food off so that you can chew them up. So it's when you're biting a piece of food off, it's the incisors that do that. Okay, the molars are these teeth at the back. Right? They are meant for grinding the food up, right? So you bite the food off with the incisors and you grind it up at the back of your mouth with the molars. This is true for all mammals, by the way, and humans are mammals, right? Now, in the beginning, uh, for other mammals, the purpose of the tongue is to position the food over the appropriate set of teeth. But humans have learned how to do other things with the tongue, namely how to speak. Right? So humans use the tongue for speech as well as for positioning the food uh, in your mouth. So if you're ever eating fast because you're eating something that you love and you bite your tongue, how is it possible you bit your tongue? You bit your tongue because you, you failed, you put a piece of food, you moved a piece, used your tongue to move a piece of food from the front of your mouth to the back of your mouth so it could be ground up by the, by the molars, but you didn't take the time to move your tongue out of the way before you bit down on the food and so you bit your own tongue. That happens every now and then. So the tongue, the original purpose of the tongue for mammals was to position the food that, that your incisors had bitten off, position that food over the, on top of the molars so you could grind it up. Okay, now we have two other teeth that are important. The cuspids are the fangs. You know, they look these these long pointed teeth that are on the top and the bottom of your mouth. If you look at a tiger or a lion, you see that their cuspids are enormous. If you look at a walrus, the, t the, the cuspids are enormous. Those giant teeth that come out of a walrus's mouth are, a walrus is a mammal, of course, those teeth are the walrus's cuspids. Now, if you're talking about animals instead of humans, if, you t if you're talking about humans, you call those fangs the cuspids. If you're talking about animals, you call them the canine teeth. Occasionally, you will hear somebody refer to the human cuspids as the canine teeth, and that's fine. It's a mistake. It's not quite the proper term. The, the actual exactly proper term is cuspids. Now, the purpose of cuspids is to kill. The, it, it is something that, that predatory animals have. So if you've ever seen a tiger chase down a deer and, and eat it, you know that uh, you know a tiger is a predator, a deer is a prey animal that is a herbivore that eats plants, not meat. A carnivore is an animal that eats flesh, eats meat. The word carni is a, is a Latin word for flesh. So uh, a carnivore is an animal that eats 
flesh the flesh of other animals now if you've seen a tiger chase down a deer you know that the first thing the tiger does is it bites the deer in the neck with with its canine teeth in order to kill it uh, so the canine teeth are meant specifically for killing. It's, it's very difficult to eat your supper if it keeps getting up and trying to run away. So it's better if you kill it right away and then it won't keep moving and then you can just eat it at your leisure. And so that's the purpose of the canine teeth. And so tigers and lions and, and bears sometimes, these predatory animals, will chase down their prey and bite it in the neck with the, can, with the canine teeth in order to kill it quickly. Biting it in the neck will tear out the uh, jugular vein and the and the carotid artery which kills it very quickly and so uh, that's what those teeth are for so then why do humans have them we don't chase down any animals and bite their necks and if we did the our canine teeth are quite small our cuspid teeth are very small so what's the point well we believe that we at some point in our evolution we evolved from uh, humans evolved and the primate family in general uh, if you look inside the mouth of a gorilla for instance you'll see that a gorilla has very large canine teeth but gorillas don't hunt animals to eat uh, they they use the they use the fangs for for uh, basically just for defense and things like that so but the but the theory is that the primate family the apes including the humans uh, were evolved from predators and then we ended up in an environment where we had to compete with better predators that are better at chasing down meat than we are. So we evolved from being uh, carnivores to being omnivores. Omnivores are things that eat both vegetables and meat. And usually if you eat meat, it's meat that is already dead and has been slightly decomposed, right? That sounds kind of disgusting, but that's what an omnivore does, right? So, so a carnivore is an animal that will only eat meat that had that it has just, it will only eat an animal that is just freshly dead, that, that it has killed in the last minute or so. An omnivore, a carnivore that does that, a carnivore that, that will only eat freshly killed meat will not eat a, a corpse that's been dead for a few days. It, it, it thinks that it smells disgusting and will go away. Whereas, uh, and honestly, that's a, that's a good policy. You don't want to eat uh, carcasses that have been partly decomposed. But an omnivore is not very good at chasing down live animals, so it, it is willing to uh, eat slightly decomposed carcasses that, have, that some, somebody else has killed, or it has died of old age or something. They, they will eat that. So humans, more or less, are omnivores. There are some humans who make a, a philosophical choice to eat only vegetables, vegetarians and vegans, of course, and there's some humans that uh, eat both meat and vegetables. Right. But gen left to their own devices without without philosophical or religious uh, overtones, humans generally eat both meat and vegetables. OK, now, the so the cuspids are the remnants of, you know, as soon as we as soon as we switched, humans switched from being uh, carnivores to omnivores. The there was no reason to have such long canine teeth. In fact, they kind of get in the way of your eating. So they kind of the, the theory is that through evolution they got smaller and smaller over the over the millennia. Okay, so humans have cuspids, but they're very small. Uh, humans also have claws, which are a sign of a carnivore. But but the, our na that that's in our case those are fingernails, and our claws are pretty pathetic for a carnivore, right? So we can't really tear anything with our claws. In fact, uh, if you try to tear something with your fingernails, your fingernails would probably come out before you you, you could succeed in tearing it. So. Uh, we have the remnants of these carnivore characteristics, but uh, that's another story. All right, so the, the cuspid teeth are the remnants of canine teeth. And then the bicuspids are just the teeth that are located between the cuspids and the molars. And so those are these ones here. All right, let's move on now and discuss classification of bone fractures. When bones break, how do we classify the breakage? Okay, so first of all, we have to ask ourselves whether the fracture is closed or compound. Now, there's a common misunderstanding that a compound fracture is where the bone is broken into several pieces. That's actually a, a mistake. A compound fracture is where you have a broken bone and the jagged broken edge of the bone actually comes out of the skin. 
That is what a compound fracture is. It's very disgusting, very, uh, very grotesque and painful to have a broken bone poke its way out of the skin. It causes bleeding, lots of bleeding and so on. So a compound fracture is quite serious compared to a closed fracture. A closed fracture is where the broken bone fragments did not break out of the skin. Okay, then you have to worry about whether you have to classify the bone fracture about as to whether it is a simple fracture or a comminuted fracture. A simple fracture is where the bone breaks in one place and a comminuted fracture is where the bone breaks into several fragments like this. And then finally, you have to worry about or classify whether the fracture is a complete fracture or what's called a green stick fracture. So a complete fracture is where the bone breaks clean through like this. A green stick fracture is where it only breaks through part of the way. And this is possible because bones, bones are quite rigid, but they're still a little bit flexible. So if you break a bone, if you fracture a bone, the fracture may not go all the way through. And so the way to think about this is if you take a stick if you take a dried out old stick that's brown and you break it, it will break with a clean snapping sound, a sharp snapping sound. Whereas if you take a, a stick that is new, a new stick that is still green and you try to break it, the odds are that it won't break completely through. One side of it will break and then the other side of it will remain attached and so you'll have that. So that's kind of the way to remember what a green stick fracture is. Okay, so let's, uh, Here's some x-rays. I'll show you some x-rays and I want you to first guess, you know, in your own time, tell me what the, which bone is broken and then tell me how you would classify the fracture. Okay, so I'll give you a minute to think about that. You can stop the video if you want. Okay, so first of all, are we looking at, I see two bones. So this could possibly be the lower leg or the lower arm, the forearm, right? Can, which one is it? All right, so these two, these two bones are different in thickness. One of them is quite a bit thinner than the other. So the thinner one must be the fibula and the thicker one must be the tibia. So we're in the lower leg, right? And then this is the, you can see where the flesh is on the, where the tissue is in addition to the bone on the x-ray. The, the broken bone doesn't appear to have come out of the skin. So this is a closed fracture. It seems to be broken in, into only two fragments. You know, it's broken in only one place. So this is a simple closed fracture. The bone is broken completely through, so it is a complete fracture. So this is a complete closed simple fracture of the tibia. Okay, this is harder to judge because the, these two, I see two bones that are nearly the same size. So which part of the body did we say that was, right? So this is obviously the forearm. The, 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 the lower arm, here are the carpals up here, right? And just by the, it's hard to tell, but uh, you know that if you look at your forearm, you know that it's thicker on the upper part. So this must, and then when you have this thick side facing upwards, the thumb is on the same side, right? So this, if the thumb is up here someplace, if the thumb is up, up on this side somewhere, this must be the radius. So this is a this is a closed, simple, complete fracture of the radius. What about this? Okay, so this is a double fracture, and this is two greens. This is a double green stick fracture of the radius and the ulna, but it is a simple fracture, not a, uh, sorry, it is a closed fracture, not a compound fracture. All right, I'm going to show you another fracture. The, which looks quite gory and bloody, so prepare yourself. But don't worry too much because this is fake. This is actually movie makeup. Somebody, the, somebody was supposed to have a broken finger in the movies, and so they put on this makeup to make it look like they have a fracture. All right, this is a fake makeup version of a compound fracture. And this is, I'm showing it to you because this is sort of what a compound fracture of the finger of, of the proximal phalanx of the first proximal phalanx of the left hand would look like, except that if, if this really was a fracture, this, this side over here would just kind of be dangling loose because it would only be held by the flesh. The bone would be completely broken. So the, the, the distal part of the finger would be dangling loose, which it is not here. So this, so this is a fake movie makeup version showing you what a compound fracture looks like. All right, let's talk about the important muscles that move these bones around.
Okay, so the skeletal muscles are attached to the skeletal bones. They are under voluntary conscious control, so we can consciously move bits of the bones here and there, right? And then bo uh, the, the, the uh, bone is moved in opposite directions by opposing pairs or sets of bones, right? Now, when you move a bone in one direction, there is usually one there is usually one muscle that is doing most of the work and we call that one muscle the prime mover and then there are usually some other smaller muscles that assist the prime mover that work together with the prime mover and when when you have one or if you have more than one thing working together cooperatively that is referred to as synergy and so synergy so these little muscles that assist the prime mover are called synergists. So when you move a bone in one direction, there's one muscle that m does most of the work, lifts most of the load called the prime mover. And it is th that movement is stabilized by a bunch of smaller muscles that are called the synergists. Okay, now when you're moving that bone in one particular direction, the muscle or the muscles that move it in one direction are called the agonists. And then there's usually another set of muscles on the other side of the bone whose job it is to move it in the opposite direction. So those muscles, muscle or muscles whose job it is to move the bone in the opposite direction are referred to as the antagonist or the antagonists. Right? So whether a bone, whether a muscle is classified as the agonist or the antagonist will depend on which direction we're trying to move the bone. Right? So if you move it in one direction, one, one muscle is the agonist and the other one on the other side is the antagonist. When you try to move that bone back in the opposite direction, the one that's on the other side becomes the agonist and vice versa. Okay, now there's another pair of terms we need to learn, and that is that every muscle that is attached to some bones, every muscle has an origin and, and an insertion point. Okay, so usually there's no, there are no examples that I know of where you have a muscle that, that is attached at both ends to the same bone. What would be the point of that? Right? So it wouldn't, it wouldn't move the bone. It would simply flex or tense uh, or relax, tense or flex or relax without moving anything because it's attached to the same bone. So that there would be no point in that. However, uh, usually bones that move the skeleton are attached to two different bones. And the, the end of the muscle that is attached to, usually the two bones that a muscle is attached to, one of the bones is meant to move and the other one is not. The other one is meant to be an anchor where the muscle is attached. And so the, 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 the attachment point of the muscle where the, the end of the muscle that is attached to the bone that doesn't move is called the origin. And the end of the muscle that's attached to the bone that does move is called the insertion point. Okay, so I'll give you some examples of all of these things. The best example is when you have, when you lift up a glass of water, for instance, the, the prime mover is this big thick muscle on the front side on the anterior side of your humerus on the anterior side of, of your upper arm called the biceps brachii so when you when you lift a glass of water the the prime mover is a muscle is a muscle called the biceps brachii it looks like it's plural plural right it says biceps that's because the muscle has is made of two main bundles, right? But it is a single, it is classified as a single muscle. Um, if you dissect it away, you cut it away, you can see that the humerus is underneath. Okay, now the biceps brachii is the prime mover for this movement. We have some synergists that help it do its job. Specifically, this muscle here in the forearm helps to stabilize this movement and it is called the brachioradialis, the brachioradialis. Right, so I might ask you a question on the test. I might say, give me one example of a prime mover and give me one example of a synergist. And you can say the biceps brachii and the brachioradialis are an example of a prime mover and a synergist. Right, now, on, you may know that, uh, let's look at the origin and the insertion point. The origin of the biceps brachii is actually the scapula. Right? So the scapula, when you lift a glass of water like this, you know that the scapula doesn't move. Your shoulder, your shoulder blade does not move when you're lifting a glass of water. The biceps brachii are anchored to the shoulder blade. 
and so when so when you lift the glass of water the shoulder blade does not move so the origin of the biceps brachii is actually the scapula okay now at the other end the biceps brachii is attached to the radius right so the insertion point for the biceps brachii is the radius right so the biceps brachii originates in the scapula and inserts into the radius it originates in the scapula inserts into the radius now you may know if you've ever done push-ups or anything like that when you push something away with your arm it's not the biceps brachii that flexes is it when you push something away like when you're doing push-ups it's the muscle set that is on the back side of your arm on the posterior side of your humerus that flexes and that that set of muscles is called the triceps brachii right so when you're lifting a glass of water the biceps brachii is the and is the agonist and the muscle that could move that limb in the opposite direction is now classified as the antagonist and that particular muscle in this case is the triceps brachii so when you're lifting a glass of water the agonist is the biceps brachii and the antagonist is the triceps brachii when you're doing push-ups the triceps brachii are the agonists and the biceps brachii are the antagonists all right so skeletal muscles are under voluntary control they they have the job of moving the bones in opposing pairs or sets so in the movement i just showed you we have the biceps brachii as as the prime mover together with the brachioradialis as a one of the synergists there's a couple of them and then those are the agonist when you're making that movement if you make the opposite movement if you move if you move the forearm in the opposite direction then it would be the triceps brachii that's the agonist and the biceps brachii would be the antagonist and the origins and the insertion points we talk about the origin is usually the attachment point for the muscle to the bone that doesn't move the insertion point is the attachment point to the bone that does move right so the biceps brachii if i asked you for an example of an or um, of the origin of a muscle and the insertion point of a muscle you can say okay the biceps brachii the biceps the the origin of the biceps brachii is the scapula the insertion point of the biceps brachii is the radi is the radius So the, for this particular movement, lifting a glass of water, the agonist is the biceps brachii located on the anterior side of the arm. The origin is the scapula, the insertion point is the radius, and the antagonist for this particular movement, not, a, not another type of movement, but for this particular movement, the antagonist by definition is the triceps brachii, which moves that same radius in the other direction. By the way, if you have, if you look at the angle that this joint makes when it bends right so this is to me that looks like a little bit more than 90 degrees if you're familiar with the de the degree system right so to me that looks like a little bit more than that it looks like maybe 100 or 110 degrees when you when you do flexion of a joint the term flexion is a movement that you, is is the term that you use to describe movement that Short, that that shortens the number of degrees of that joint so if we flex this muscle if we flex the biceps brachii and the brachioradialis we decrease the angle of this joint that's called that is referred to as flexion or muscle flexion if you move it in the opposite direction in a direction that increases the number of degrees in this joint it increases the angle of this joint that is called extension Right, so when the biceps brachii becomes tense, when it contracts, when it shortens, it causes a type of movement that is referred to as radi radial flexion. When the triceps brachii tenses and contracts, it pulls the forearm in the opposite direction, and that movement is called radial extension. Right, so when, you're, when you flex your biceps brachii and you move your forearm up towards your shoulder, that's called radial flexion when you move it away from your shoulder that's called radial extension so that's a way that you describe movements of the human body okay let's just run through a quick list of the important muscles that you need to memorize for this course the muscles that are written in black are visible on the anterior side of the body we're looking at the front of this 
this uh, body, so this is an anterior view. On the other side, the posterior side, we do not have a posterior view, so you won't be able to see these muscles because they're on the other side. All right, but let's learn these. So the deltoid, deltoid is this kind of triangular triangular muscle in your neck that you use to shrug your shoulders. Those are the deltoids that you have a pair of them. So you have a left and a right deltoid. Collectively, they're called the deltoids. On the posterior side of the body, you have some muscles that kind of form a big V shape that are called trapezi uh, trapezius muscles, right? And uh, trapezius muscles are located on the basically on your back, and they have the they have the function of pulling your arms backwards, like when you're doing a chin up exercise. Okay, these big muscles on the front of your upper chest are referred to as the pectoralis major. And if you cut away the pectoralis major, you will see underneath there are some smaller muscles that are called the pectoralis minor. They, they are only visible if you cut away the pectoralis major. You already know what the biceps brachii is. It's this muscle on the anterior surface of the humerus, right? And the antagonistic muscle on the back side of the humerus, on the posterior side of the humerus, is called the triceps brachii. Now, if you look, if you dissect away the pectoralis major and you, you cut away the pectoralis major, you cut away the pectoralis minor, you will see some little tiny muscles that are in between the ribs that are called intercostal muscles. The word costal, costal in biology refers to the ribs. Right? So for instance, there's a, a word called costal cartilage. That means the cartilage that's, that's referred to the rib, that, that's uh, attached to the ribs that we talked about before. That is referred to as costal cartilage. So these are the inter, inter means between. So these are the intercostal muscles. The intercostal muscles are little tiny muscles that are located in between the ribs that are used for breathing. So when you take a breath, the intercostal muscles pull the ribs together which has the effect of pulling the, the front of the rib cage upwards and outwards and filling the air with lungs, right? So at some point in the course, I will probably ask you, what do you call the muscles that allow the, the rib cage to lift upwards and outwards in order to fill the, uh, fill the lungs with air? The answer is the intercostal muscles. Or I could ask you, what is the function of the intercostal muscles, right? So the inter and or what is the location of the intercostal muscles? Or I could ask you, what does the what does the suffix costal refer to? And the answer is, it refers to the ribs. And so there are a number of words that we use in anatomy that refer to the ribs, and they usually have the the term costal or costa in in the name. Okay, the rectus abdominis muscles are these muscles that we have on the front of the stomach. Right, they help you when you're doing, these are being used when you're doing sit-ups. People often do sit-ups because they want to have this nice thing that in North America, they call it a six pack because there are six muscles there that make these six neat little lumps that make it look like you're very fit and very athletic. They call that a six pack. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, well, the, the, tr the true name is the rectus abdominis muscles. Okay, the rectus femoris muscles you see the word femur in there, right? The rectus femoris muscles are what uh, muscle in the front part of your leg, the anterior surface of the leg that causes the lower leg to move forward as if you were kicking a ball. So when you're kicking a soccer ball, the main muscle, the, the main, the agonist for that movement is the rectus femoris. And then if you want to pull your leg back again after you've kicked the ball, the antagonistic set of muscles is on the back side of the leg, the posterior side of the leg, and they are, they are called the biceps femoris. Right? So the biceps femoris are responsible for flexion of the knee. The rectus femoris, are responsible, rectus femoris muscle is responsible uh, for extension of the knee joint. All right, so to summarize what we talked about in this lecture, we learned about the word osteo, which is the root, root word for, for uh, bone tissue. We talked about the differences between cartilage and osseous tissue, bone tissue. We talked about an exoskeleton versus an endoskeleton. Humans, of course, have an endoskeleton. We talked about compact bone versus spongy bone and the fact that compact bone is made of osteons, whereas spongy bone is made of trabeculae. Spongy bone is the location of hematopoiesis. You must learn the word hematopoiesis. It's very important. Uh, and um, uh, we talked about different types of osteocytes, osteoblasts versus osteoclasts. We talked about how those two types of bone cells are involved in bone remodeling. 
And we learned that humans at some point, usually in their 20s, their early 20s, reach what is known as peak bone mass. And then the amount of strength and bone tissue they have starts to decline every year from then on until you get to be very elderly where your bones are very brittle. Uh, we talked about all the muscle that we talked about all the major bones in the skeletal system and we talked about all the major muscles that move those bones and are responsible for movement. All right, in the next lecture we will talk about the digestive system and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.